Britonia had fallen. Skaven gnawed under the earth to assault the mountain dwarves, and Archon's vanguard prepared to assault Altdorf. Gilles Le Breton leads his broken kingdom of cavaliers to the heart of the Empire to defend the heartland of humanity. Yet still a dark ritual is prepared in the east, in the surviving vampiric imperial county of Sylvania, where Manfred von Karstein devises a plan to rival the cunning of even the Skaven. Welcome to our latest episode on the end times of Warhammer Fantasy, where we will cover the fall of the Empire of Man. There's not much time left for the Warhammer world, but today let another world of your own imagination come into being with help from this video's sponsor, World Anvil. This is a program that manages a creative world. That means it stores your maps, creature and character designs, timelines, relationship diagrams, factions, and a wiki of lore, and links all of these things together so that you have a complete world to explore. Then it lets you use your world for adventure. You can update the state of the lore through World Anvil to track the progress of a Dungeons & Dragons campaign, or loads of other tabletop rule sets too. Alternatively, use the resources as a database for writing a novel. You can do the writing inside World Anvil to link everything up with the lore and design materials. This makes collaborating extra easy, as everyone can see what the official canon currently is at any time, and cross-referencing between all parts of the world keeps things consistent and plot-hole free. If you're not sure what to add or where to start, World Anvil provides loads of world-building templates to create a world in an archetypal style, such as medieval fantasy or cyberpunk. You can check out World Anvil via our link in the description. If you use our code WIZARDS, they'll give you 40% off all recurring memberships, so support our channel and your imagination by taking a look. This land is my home, my birthright. The wind and rain are my allies, the trees and stones are my foot soldiers, the very earth will rise up against you should you try to take it from me, and my people will feast on your bones. Manfred von Karstein, the Lord of Sylvania In the years leading up to the end times proper, the vampire Lord Manfred von Karstein had travelled the world, seeking out disciples of the first and greatest necromancer Nagash particularly in the ruined Lamia, an ancient Nehekarin city, infamously inhabited by Queen Neferata herself, first of all vampires. In ancient times, when Nagash walked the realms, Neferata disobeyed her father, King Lamiza, and pursued the mortuary cult's goal to obtain eternal life. As a woman, she was forbidden from practicing magic or partaking in priesthood, but despite this, with the discreet aid of the high priest of the cult, she created a modified elixir of life. The first elixir, crafted by Nagash, was derived from human blood and imbued the drinker with immortality and youth. However, because Neferata was not skilled in necromantic magics, she unintentionally botched the original recipe and drank an elixir that transformed her and her followers into the first vampires. Cursed with the eternal, unrelenting thirst for blood, they cast out the original mortuary cult from Lamia and replaced them with their own cult of Nagash, with Neferata ruling from her seat at the Temple of Blood. It was here, among the handmaidens and the eldest vampires in the world, that Manfred's magical prowess sharpened, and he swore a pact with corrupted wraith wizards to aid in the revival of the great necromancer to bring a new order to the world. With Nagash becoming more like a god than a man in the eyes of his followers, his spirit had become unreachable, even with Manfred's many magics. A powerful ritual, Manfred realized, was required to summon the necromancer, and he set upon the world again to enact a plan of his own. You have read the signs as clearly as I. The growing power of chaos makes no distinction between the living and the dead. Nagash must rise, or our realms of silence will fall and yours will be the first. Arkan the Black, offering Manfred his unholy pact. Before the civil war in Britonia had reached its crescendo, in the west, the High Elves of Ulthuan sent Aliathra, destined heir to the throne of Everqueen, to strengthen diplomatic ties with the dwarves. Manfred, seeking innocent and powerful souls in which to fuel a grand spell of resurrection, conspired with Lichmaster Heinrich Kemmler to capture the princess and sully relations between the two powerful factions. 
Kemmler manipulated the Greenskins into a sudden surprise attack on the fortress in which the meetings were held, and successfully captured the Everchild within the claws of a terrorgeist, stealing her away to Sylvania, where she would be locked away in preparation for the ritual. The vampire also succeeded in luring the Grand Theogenist, Volkmar the Grim, into a trap as the Theogenist marched into the western territories of Sylvania to purge the vampires from the Lost County. In his failure, Volkmar was stolen away just as the Everchild was, to further power the resurrection of Nagash. But just as Manfred was to enact another plan to kidnap another innocent and powerful soul, Gelt summoned his first golden bastion around Sylvania, effectively trapping Manfred in his domain for a time as Kislev fell in the north and the Bretonian civil war began. However, the vampire lord soon discovered that his agenda was in step with that of Arkan the Black, who at the time was assisting Malabord in his bloody crusade against Luan's armies. Arkan, after settling on a truce with Manfred, continued his support of Malabord in the west. During the Duke of Armand's failed rebuke of Malabord's rebellion at the Forest of Chalon, the disappearance of Morgiana the Fey Enchantress was entirely the doing of Arkan and Manfred's convoluted plot. Once in the lands of Sylvania, the Everchild Aliathra, Volkmar the Grim, Morgiana, and six other innocent souls were tortured and slain. With the presence of the nine artifacts of Nagash, the Necromancer returned to the world, stronger than ever before. I hereby make eternal claim to that which is mine. Sylvania thus secedes from thy petty empire, as do all who dwell within her borders. Mortal or grave-bound, they are mine by feudal law, and let none dispute it. Look to the east, and thou shalt find I have drawn a shroud of night across my rightful realm. In this way I demarc it from thine own lands, where sunlight and hope are still welcome guest. Perhaps I will attend thy yearly feast of words some day, and feast upon thee in turn. Worthless and brief as you are, it would be a mercy. I predict little nourishment and little challenge. For how can the great leaders of the empire protect its borders when they are barely aware of what is taking place under their noses? Letter from Count Manfred von Karstein to the Conclave of States in Altdorf Whether Manfred actually knew what was brewing beneath the sewers of Altdorf or not is unclear, but his insight was correct nonetheless. As the Bretonians emerged from the winding path through Athol-Loren and out of the mountain pass west of Wissenland, Gilles Le Breton and Luan Lyoncourt closed the distance between their cavaliers and the awaiting defence in Altdorf, entirely blind to the seed of destruction planted beneath the capital by Nurgle. A once proud imperial physician, corrupted by the erupting plagues across the empire, stirred his pox cauldron as the attack on Altdorf approached. After having failed to contain and cure the terrible gnashing fever, Dr. Festus, Festus the Leech Lord, locked himself in a deep underground laboratory, desperately trying to do his duty for the Emperor and indeed mankind's survival. Driven mad by the slack-jawed corpses whispering the promise of knowledge and the cure to all plagues, Festus swore himself to the allegiance of Nurgle. In but a moment of feverish nightmare, Nurgle granted Festus visions of every sickness and ailment, his compassion rotting away until the good doctor had nothing more but the twisted desire to breed disease and plague in the name of the Chaos God. With his body mutating and bloating into a hideous behemoth, Festus became an exalted champion of Nurgle and prepared an ambush from right under the nose of the Empire. Erupting in a new fetid birth from the cauldron, Kugath Plaguefather was summoned to the sewers of Altdorf after his supreme victory over Sinch's invasion in Muzion. The day that the Glotkin and Gutrot Spoom's combined forces were to arrive from doomed Marienburg was the Night of Mysteries, or Geheimnisnacht. That night, the accursed green Chaos Moon and smaller twin of Manslieb rose high in the dark night, granting the winds of magic a turbulent and chaotic boost in power. In the Imperial capital, the Emperor was not present in the defending garrison. As a further stroke of bad luck for the Empire, Karl Franz had been presumed dead at the Battle of Heffingen, and Kurt Helborg had been left as the steward of the Empire after Karl's apparent demise. 
Helborg simultaneously sent couriers bearing desperate pleas for aid as he reinforced the western district of the city, which hosted the Imperial Palace and Colleges of Magic, and an easy way into the south portion of the city if the garrison could manage to defend and maintain control of the gate. Luen Leung Ker, having received word of the oncoming assault from the west, rallied his crusader knights and began a march towards Altdorf. Additionally, Munvaj the Cruel, who was thrown from the Swedok Beast in the destruction of Marienburg, was found by Vlad von Karstein upstream on the River Reich to the east of the city. Bestowing information to the vampire count on the sheer enormity of Nurgle's forces about to converge on Altdorf, Vlad and Munvard gathered four additional vampires and travelled swiftly into the city of Altdorf. There, out of desperation, Helborg agreed to ally the Imperial forces with the undead. Then, as the winds of magic turned most potent, the vampires raised an enormous host of undead, whose ranks ranged from ancient and long-buried warriors to the recently slain. In addition to the massive garrison of the Reichsguard knights defending key points within the sprawling streets of Altdorf, the Imperial engineers manned rocket artillery and the Colleges of Magic supplied priests from the Gold, Light, Jade and Bright orders. To oppose them in the first wave of battle, the Great Chaos Host, led by the Glotkin and Gutrot Spoom, sported an immense horde of Nurglings, Beastmen, Chaos Chariots and even the terrible Torox, a Doom Bull general made of brass and fire, committed to trampling the Empire beneath his cloven hooves. As the Glotkin and Gutrot advanced en masse towards the Western Wall, the Chaos Moon reached the height of its ascension and signalled the start of Festus's trap. From beneath the sewers and under the Temple of Shalya, the goddess of healing and mercy, a putrid green tear in reality summoned the joyful throng led by Festus and Kugath. The buzzing wings of rotflies swarmed the temple and commanded the aerial advantage over the city, whilst plague bearers and stem cutter, a soul grinder of Nurgle, pounced their ambush upon any unlucky defenders to have been caught in their trap. From the great portal, rotting jungles of pox growths exploded in spores and draped Altdorf in a sickly, treacherous landscape. In the south, Leonker ordered his errant knights to sally out in a charge of 100 lances against the advancing Nurglings on the west wall, while he, mounted upon his massive hippogriff, Bikis, and leading 12 Pegasus knights, flew over the southern wall and soared a charge into the swarms of rotflies around the Temple of Shalia. To support the High Paladin's contest, Vlad von Karstein arrived at the temple and slaughtered the Nurglings piecemeal. Swooping down once the skies around the temple were cleared, Luan and Bequis suffered a costly duel with Kugath. With his golden blessed blood pouring from his wounds inflicted by the great unclean one, Kugath melted to his demise under Luan's blessing from the lady. Hanging on to life, still but greatly weakened, Festus then took his chance to end the life of the High Paladin in the name of Nurgle. The Bretonian knight faltered to the leech lord, thrown to the ground from his hippogriff. Smiling still, even in the face of the serrated blade that would decapitate him, Luar perished just as Vlad von Karstein flanked Festus and cleaved his head from his fat shoulders. Securing the temple just as the western walls were breached, Munvaj the Cruel summoned the Swedok Beast to carry him to the front lines for a rematch against the Glotkin. While the vampire lord stalled the Glotkin, the Emperor was found to be alive and returned to the city from the south. From there, Vlad, Karl and Helborg organized their remaining knights and militia to defend the Imperial Palace at all costs. Hellfire rockets pelted the oncoming armies, as Munvaj the Cruel was annihilated in combat by Ethrak's pestilent magic. The Glotkin lumbered through the maze of green hellscape and converged their broken army onto the palace. Vlad and Otto clashed in a bloody blitz of single combat, with the ancient vampire lord easily besting the eldest Glotkin. However, just as Vlad had secured a decisive advantage and the death of Otto for the combined forces of man and undead, he was infected with the foul blood of Nurgle's champion and was forced to resign from battle. Karl led the remaining beastmen and Glotkin deliberately into the heart of the palace, where a stream of fire from the Imperial Dragon immolated the beastmen and supporting Nurglings. 
Helborg, defending the Emperor, was slain by Otto, who then turned his scythe onto the Emperor and ended Franz's life. Just as the battle seemed to be lost, a glorious golden light enveloped the body of the slain Emperor. Reborn as the host of Sigmar Heldenhammer, Karl Franz became the incarnate of heaven and rallied his men to retreat to the east, abandoning Altdorf to her green, poisoned fate. I have seen the world's demise. More sleep, the accursed orb waxes large, impossibly large. The moon will fall, the oceans will boil, the mountains will break. To the stars some will go, but the stars themselves will abandon this world. The scratching beyond the walls can only mean one thing. The vermin are here. It is they that gnaw at the greyed ends of the world. Ceaselessly they plot, tirelessly they agitate. Yet never once do they imagine that they too are puppets, moving upon strings they never envisioned. The worst is still ahead. Prophecy of the End Times For the dwindling remnants of civilization, Morsleib's eerie green glow had yet another final terrible strike upon the world. It was with the hand of the Skaven that this would be achieved, for the Rat Men correctly assumed that the Dark Moon was made entirely out of their most coveted resource, Warpstone. With the Skaven's Great Ascension actively overrunning the world, it became clear to the Council of Thirteen that they needed more Warpstone, more than their legions of slaves were able to mine at once for the Rat Men war machine. And so, while the Empire and Bretonia fled to Averheim following the sacking of Altdorf, Skaven Blight plotted to bring the moon to them. In conjunction with their systematic invasion of Talea, Estalia, and the southern mountains beneath the Empire, the Council of Thirteen coordinated a second invasion that would reach all the way into the jungles of Lustria, where the Lizardmen ruled in their temples and pyramids of the Old Ones. Skaven were notorious for infighting and backstabbing, and just as the Council had agreed on the plan to use the moon to their advantage, the Grey Seer clan was ousted from the Council and humiliated by Clan Skyre. Lord Morskitar of Clan Skyre provided a more daring, precise strike against the moon with the creation of a moon shatter, a warpstone rocket built to carry a massive warpstone bomb to shatter Morsleib and rain meteors of raw warpstone onto the planet, simultaneously killing all of Lustria and providing the Skaven with more than enough ammunition to take over the world. However, one Grey Seer schemed to ruin Lord Morskitar's plan, and to reclaim the Grey Seer's power among the dreaded council. Thanqual, elder among his rat kin, and orchestrator of the alliance between Chaos and Skaven in the early days of the End Times, proposed that the Seers might summon the Vermin Lords, demonic manifestations of the Great Horned Rat, into their realm to recover their place in Skaven Blight. To his dismay, the other Grey Seers chittered an outburst onto Thanqual, blaming him for all of the troubles and strife the Grey Seers had sustained during their ousting. Stripping Thanqual of his status, he was cast out as an exile and left to rot, while the remaining Grey Seers stole his idea for their own benefits. Through a green tear in reality, the Grey Seers summoned the Vermin Lords. Massive horned rats with whip tails and cloven hooves emerged to grace the presence of the cowering Grey Seers. The Vermin Lords revealed to them the secret to harnessing the Green Moon's power, and as quickly as they scurried into the realm, they vanished with the echoing laughter of the horned rat. Deep in Lustrian territory, and unknown to the Slan Mage priests, Clan Pestilens prepared to emerge from the swamps and forests once Morsleib had been shattered. Heeding the advice of the Vermin Lord demons, the Grey Seers usurped the immense power of the Slan and began to pull the Chaos Moon closer to the world. Some nights the moon would travel miles and miles closer, and other nights it would pulse with crackling, unstable power. Realizing he had been bested by the Grey Seers yet again, Morskatar furiously punished his chief warlock engineer, Ikit Claw, by sending him to the front lines of the wars against the Dwarves hoping to kill him for his lackluster performance. Before elves, before dwarves, before men, the Old Ones arrived upon this world. Then came chaos, and the great plan of the Old Ones was unmade. 
We are the last of their servants, and only by our hand shall the great plan be restored, with the total defeat of the usurping younger races. Inscription upon the eastern boundary stone of the temple city of Hexoatl. The toad-like sages of the Lizardmen, Slan, eventually detected the ever-nearing moon and challenged the Grey Seers in an arcane struggle. Emptying the geomantic web of all its power, they stopped the moon's advance for a moment to allow their Saurus champions time to defend the Temple of Itza, the first city and greatest of the surviving temple cities. The entire continent of Lustria would be torn asunder in the second Skaven invasion, but not without a bloody fight from the Lizardmen, defenders of the world. More videos on the end times are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we will catch you on the next one.